I'm David Thorburn, the director of the MIT Communications Forum. My job today is entirely ceremonial. Uh, I want to uh, mention, however, in a in a in a uh, in a in a, in a uh, tone of yes. not lamentation exactly, but some nostalgia, uh, that this marks the final forum in which the uh, MIT Communications Forum and the Center for Future Civic Media are collaborating. And I wanted to say again what I said last week, that this forum, which is I think Brad the 13th or the 14th, I think it's the 14th forum that the Center for Civic Media and the Communications Forum have jointly sponsored. It's been one of the most productive and nourishing relationships that the Communications Forum has ever had. I'm especially grateful to Chris, to the staff at, at the Center, some of many of whom have now, have now departed, but were very helpful to us in the, in the beginning of this project. And I, I want to express my gratitude to them and my pride in the accomplishments of these 14 forums. The Center for Future Civic Media is moving off, uh, will, will continue running events of this sort, but without our collaboration, I want to wish them the best of luck and, and uh, promise as, as much support as we're able to give. I also wanted to say one other word about the project of the Center for Future Media, which I much admire. And one of the reasons I admire it is that it treads, it walks an awfully dangerous thin line, and so far at least it seems to me to have walked it with astonishing grace. And the line, of course, is the line between uh, significant, if not objective, at least uh, 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 serious and thoughtful discourse on the one side and advocacy on the other. It's a profoundly difficult uh, task to balance those two. And the Center for, f the f for Future Civic Media is, I think, uh, at least so far in its in its remarkable career, an exemplary instance of an of of, of an inst of, of a project working within the confines of an of a university, uh, generating uh, uh, significant uh, uh, discourse of a rigorous and if not scholarly, deeply citizenly kind, and some of it is a scholarly discourse as well. Yet at the same time, respecting that rigor, also also committed to some forms of citizen activism that any reasonable person would feel is appropriate and valuable. It's a very complicated and I think uh, quite remarkable achievement on the part of the center uh, at, and today's forum is an instance of the kind of problem that such an interest, a combination of interest in, in uh, a serious attention to the problems of the society coupled with a commitment to empowering uh, citizens to do something about them. It's a very remarkable project and so far it seems to me this Center for Civic Media has, has set an example of great excellence and intelligence. Uh, my task now is simply to turn the podium over to Andrew Whitaker who is the chief organizer of this particular forum and I thought I would end by saying watching uh, uh, Andrew struggled with the complexities of trying to set up the forum. My admiration for him, in, uh, which was already high, increased. And uh, uh, if this forum is a success, no matter how eloquent and articulate your speakers are or your wonderful moderator is, Andrew deserves much of the credit. Andrew. Thank you, David. Um, I guess my role is uh, equally ceremonial in uh, being able to thank you for uh, allowing the Center for Future Civic Media to um, share in a number of communications forums over the last few years. Um, it's given us great uh, access to a built-in audience um, and given us a chance to um, really learn how uh, these kind of events can be pulled off um, in the MIT environment with MIT audiences um, and you know the attendance tonight, the speakers that we have, the interest that we have afterwards online is testament to I think a really great collaboration. Uh, I, the only other thing I want to say before I uh, hand it over to Tom is uh, to give a little bit of background about where this came from. Um, we happened back in August to be uh, looking at some ideas for what we could do for our fora in, uh, in the semester. And it happened to be right around the time of the uh, BP oil spill. Um, a question came to my mind then uh, of what happened after the well was capped. Um, how do you keep uh, a country's attention on an issue that's going to be around for many years with a, a region recovering, uh, businesses coming back to life, um, regulations, new regimes, uh, all kinds of interests in an area that is going to need media attention, but we don't necessarily know how to 
uh, do it the best way? How can we prevent something like this from happening in the future through journalism or through other kinds of civic media? Um, so that's when people like Abram came to mind um, as someone who has covered the Gulf region for a while. Uh, and related to that, it brought up a number of other questions um, of whether or not uh, traditional journalism is the best way to uh, talk about slow-moving crises, these kinds of crises that uh, evolve over time or could be warned about years ahead of time uh, and need action but don't necessarily get it. Um, so that's where we came to, uh, uh, to our other speakers um, to be able to talk a, a little bit about imaginative literature or science writing. Um, to be able to, uh, to really understand the variety or the spectrum of, uh, of reportage, of storytelling um, for uh, these kinds of issues to be able to prevent them or act on them in the future. Um, so that's where it kind of came from. And I thought of Tom as well as a great person to be able to moderate this. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Tom Levinson. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to speak very, very briefly because these people have much more important things to say than anything I could come up with. Um, and thank you all for coming. It's a great crowd for you know, this edge of the holiday season, and I'm very grateful to you for showing up. On um, the issue of slow-moving crises, crises, or more particularly the, the problem journalism has in covering time-bound, time-weighted stories, it has a kind of recursive quality to it. Because dealing with those stories is um, at the center of just about every conversation you have about journalism and public or civic media, uh, in part because that me you know, th those activities are in the midst of a slow-moving crisis that we're all very well aware of. Um, we, could, we could report on ourselves and get some insight into this difficulty. It's cliche, of course, and I'm not going to go deep into it here, but obviously there's a wealth of new technology that fosters, or seems to, uh, ubiquitous and instantaneous coverage which can lead to both greater transparency and greater democratization of the choice of stories, the coverage of stories, all the ways we create a shared experience of the world, shared understanding of the world. And that's, you know, that's the good spin. There is this lovely possibility here that many, many people are genuinely exploited, it, it, exploiting. It's a spin, but it's also got uh, significant elements of truth in it. But obviously there's the other side um, that also has a great deal of, of truth in it, which is that all the Twitter and blogging and instant video and, and everything else that we can do, um, you know, I mean, I love the fact that you can take an iPhone, edit and stream live to the web with a, a few hundred dollar device that will operate presumably anywhere in the world or, or many places in the world. I mean, so, you know, for somebody who started my filmmaking career um, working with, uh, you know, Aton cameras and Steenbeck flatbed editing machines, this is a revelation. It's just insane that you can do this. Um, and it creates a whole different uh, approach to the world. But it also fosters an updated version of the old it bleeds, it leads uh, approach. Um, and one can see how the, the, the continuous updating, the continuous emergence of the new, and the continuous explosion of the amount of information um, the amount of, of, of websites you can go to, the complexity of the web connection. There's a, a fellow in the audience, Ralph Lombrelli, who gave us a wonderful talk about how all the, way we are, all the ways we are organizing information on the web is going to collapse under its own weight with a very, within a very few years if we don't figure out some very, very important problems there. You know, there's, there's a lot of problems with this notion that somehow just the explosion of the availability of information and technology to distribute it quickly is going to give us anything uh, remotely like what we either want or need out of journalism. Um, you know, and it's clearly a problem for anything, any story that requires more than the least quantum of uh, journalistic attention to cover. And I'm not even talking about here the problems of the, the quantum of, um, of audience attention. I think some of the, the, the panel will talk about that. But, you know, you can see there's this huge issue. Um, excuse me, that's supposed to be off. It is now. Um, but either way, every crisis, you know, the, 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 there's a deeper problem, or, or rather there's a problem you can look at not from the technology side, but from the actual story side, which is, you know, we talk about slow-moving crises as a specific problem, but every crisis is slow-moving, at least over part of its life cycle. I mean, it's easy to see how the, the Gulf oil spill is slow-moving sort of forward in time. The, the, the well blows and then there are consequences and even after the well is capped there are consequences that are, that are going to unfold over decades and we have to find some way of, of keeping on top of that. But I don't know how many of you here are, are 
remember Burton Ruscha's marvelous series in the New Yorker, The Disease Detectives? That's a slow-moving crisis in the other direction in time. You know, something happens, people die, and Burton Ruscha did these marvelous stories where he would go back and under, uncover what had happened and what it took to actually unravel this, you know, this human tragedy, human pain, and what its, you know, what its significance might be for doing anything we might want to do in the future. And these were enormously complicated stories to do, but they reflect the fact that, you know, you can have somebody shot on a street corner uh, in, in, in Boston, and the story seems to be that murder, but there's actually, uh, you know, that story leads to all kinds of other stories, which may, may unravel in both directions in great distances of time, and we haven't got necessarily very good tools for covering them. So enough of that. Clearly this is the area for the panel to discover, and, uh, and I want to leave them all the time we can for that. I just want to say that this is clearly one of the reasons that MIT, the Center for uh, Future Civic Media, the Communications Forum, the, the various folks here who are concerned with interpreting the made world, um, are doing what universities and journalists are both trying to do, uh, which is to construct stories that open up this uh, extension of their subjects in time, forward or back, finding or making the technologies and the forms such stories uh, need to find audiences out there in the world, and to be found, you know, and 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 then you know, and and to exist in forms that the audiences can find them. It's it's obviously a two-way street, um, and uh, and I hope we're going to learn more about both the the context of this problem and specific responses to it from our panel. So that's a that's a swift cut through this. Let's turn to that panel. We have three speakers, and I'll give a brief bio for each as their turn emerges, um, but I'd like to ask them to go in this order. We're going to ask Rosalind Williams to speak first, and then Abram Lustgarten, and finally Andrea uh, Pitzer. There's method here, in that Ros is going to look at some of the ways a historian can understand the idea of, crisis, uh, of crises over, uh, excuse me, English is my first language, just I wrestle with it sometime. It wins. The idea, so Roz is going to look at the historian's take on this problem. Um, Andrew is going to talk to us, um, not so much I hear about uh, BP, but about another uh, energy-related story that has a similar uh, long tail, and I'm not sure which direction he's going to point that tail for us, but we're going to learn more about that. And Andrea is going to speak to us on the idea of narrative, on, on story, on how reporting should, should, can, may be done now and in the near future. She's not going to go millions of miles out, but she's going to, she, she's going to give us a sense of the lay of the land now and in the near future. Format. I'm asking each speaker to speak for 15 minutes, and then we'll have five minutes or so of questions directed to that speaker so that you can, you know, pull something out of the talk right away. At the end, I'll take the moderator's privilege and probably ask a couple of questions of my own, but then it'll be a free-for-all for around an hour, and, uh, and we'll have some fun. And, uh, and that's the way it'll go. So let's begin with um, Roz Williams. Let me give you a brief introduction to Roz, uh, whose career is such that brevity does great damage to the extent of her, her, of, of her work and accomplishments. Um, for the purposes of this audience, um, I want to note a couple of things. I mean, uh, first of all, Roz is uh, a professor at MIT in the Science, Technology, and Society program. Uh, she's been associated with MIT for a very long time. She has a depth of knowledge of this institution and of scholarship in, um, in science and technology studies, the history of science and technology, uh, that runs really deep. Um, what I loved in looking over the, 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 the biography, the short bio that I got for this, is the reminder that, you know, Roz has been thinking about the kinds of questions that we're addressing today uh, since the very beginning of her career. Her first book, Dream Worlds, Mass Consumption in Late 19th Century France, 1982, um, explores the complicated relations between technological change, cultural values, and marketing techniques at a point when the consumer society was first emerging. So, you know, one of the important things about long tail stories is those tales, those long tales take us deep into the history of the modern world, and Roz is the perfect person to tell us about that. She's written um, three other books, a fourth is on the way, she's done everything you can do at MIT, both in service to the institution and in pursuit of scholarship, and with that, please, Roz, take it away. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. It's kind of a slow time of the day, uh, it's a slow moving day, but it's a slow time, so I appreciate you showing up, <coughs> and I feel sort of like an 
interloper, being the historian, and I haven't done journalism since high school. Uh, so I'm very aware that I'm, I am not sure how this is going to uh, go over with you, but I'm going to give it a try. Um, because historians and journalists do deal with a lot of the same material. The events are very similar, and I think there's some friendly competition about who gets the most fun with the events. And can you hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay. So uh, Mark Twain seemed to think that uh, journalists had the fun with the news and the historians are just the pale reflectors later on. Um, on the other hand, a historian like Garton Ash is trying to write a history of the present because he's very intrigued by the connections between the journalism and the his historism uh, views of the same uh, material. So basically, there's convergence, or I sh might say friendly competition. The main difference is that the obvious one, that the journalists are dealing with short-term events as they happen. They want to be first, well, what did, what did Twain say, first and best. The historians are trying to get more of a distance in time, the pale reflection. So the difference is time constant. It's, it's um, the rate of change or the, or the the time element is the obvious distinction between the two um, types of professions. But then this brings us to the concept of crisis. And Tom, we all wrestle with the language and, and uh, that's one of the things we should be doing. So uh, a crisis comes from the, the Greek word which I'm told is pronounced kiran, and it's a very uh, kind of harsh verb. It's to separate or cut or shear. So there's nothing subtle about it, nothing slow moving. It's making a cut. So for example, the same word is the root of the word certain, as in date certain. Boom, that's it. That's the date. Uh, so it's fixed and settled and stated. That's what crisis means. And uh, the definition of it, therefore, is of a decisive stage. There can be a long series of events, but the crisis is a turning point or a decisive point in, that, in those series of events when change for better or for worse happens. So it can be a medical term. Uh, the illness leads to a crisis for better or for worse. The pa patient recovers or doesn't. It also has astrological meaning and it was used in this sense from the 1500s. Now, if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, you can see as early in the 1600s, people are using crisis in the sense of relating to politics or human events, the news, if you will. And if, as if on cue, it's in the middle of the, of the 1800s, the 19th century, where the word crisis begins to be turned into you know, double words or used in somewhat more metaphorical senses or combined with other words to make compound ones. So from the mid-1800s on, the word crisis is being used in this way. It can be collective, it can be individual, you can have a life crisis, a uh, personal crisis, but it's an unstable state of affairs reaches a decisive point. That's a crisis. So. The, w the word crisis combined with slow moving is an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense. It's a deliberate, it, it's a contradiction. And that to me is very interesting because that tells us that something is happening in the world that hasn't happened before and our language has not caught up with um, the events. And that's what interests me about slow moving crises because we all sort of say, yeah, we, you know, we have some intuitive sense of what that means, but it doesn't, it's not inherent in the word and in fact it contradicts the meaning of the word. So I, I'm going to propose that we, we are faced with what my colleague Leo Marx calls a semantic void. And this is the uh, article just published this past summer where he talks about what a semantic void is. And briefly, it's where you have events, things happening, and we don't have language, we don't have words and concepts to fit those events. And he uses this uh, concept to refer to the word technology 
pointing out that it only emerged really in, really, I mean, okay, MIT is named in 1861, but that's rare. It's only in the 1930s, 40s, and particularly the post-war world that that word is important. Now, okay, that's telling you that something is happening where we need a word that we did, hadn't had before. So my question for you is what historical experience or experiences are happening that make us need the concept and word slow-moving crises? And maybe we'll get a better word in time, but for now that's what we have. So I'm going to propose there are two types of events that are new and distinctive that drive us to this phrasing. So I want to first bring up the concept of slow history. Um, to classical writers like Herodotus or whatever, um, the classical historians, history consists of human actions, deeds, and words that take place on a stage called the world. And that stage is quite stable. It has cycles, recurring cycles, but that stage is utterly predictable. And human life cuts across, you know, walks out on that stage and acts. And the frailty of the individual human is contrasted to the recurrent cycles of that stage called the world. So the first idea that maybe the stage could be part of history, that it changes with history, that the world is something that historians should pay attention to, that only happens in the 1920s about the same time the word technology is appearing. And, and you know, every historian takes historiography and we learn about the Annal School and we learn about Baudel and Le Croix-Laudry and we learn that they brought the world onto the historical, into the historical texts. And you'll notice that Brodel's book is called the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean World. Okay, the world becomes a, a subject of history. Uh, the, the famous book, The Peasants of Languedoc, the writer uh, s explains that he, the protagonist of the book, Laudery says, is the great agrarian cycle lasting from the end of the 15th century to the beginning of the 18th. An agrarian cycle is the actor. So this is a new kind of history. And the Annals School is proposing there are three time constants or wavelengths of history. And they are proposing that structure, geography, uh, environment, we would now say, the long durée, the long duration, belongs in history. And they begin to write about it for the first time, really. Then on a sort of medium wavelength is the conjuncture, which is social and, and political history, which might run out to two or three centuries. And then there are events, the history of events. And this is the short duration, events, politics, individual people with individual names. So these are the three time constants. Now you'll notice the implication that there is a substructure. I mean, they're, they're saying there's a structure to history that's not human. It's beyond consciousness. It's the environment we live in, and it very much influences us. It's very, I don't know if you want to say deterministic, but it's certainly shaping of events. But it's not human, at least conscious human effort. So that's the idea of the long duration history. Well, what happens in the next, well, it's not even a century since the 1920s. What happens is that people realize that that history, the long duration, is being sped up incredibly. In other words, environmental change no longer takes centuries and centuries. It takes sometimes decades. And I'm just going to, you know, these are very typical charts that you will, the chart is harder to read. These kinds of things are easier to read. And anytime you teach world history, you have graphs like this, and they are all the same graph, because they're all pretty flat, and then about the, you know, 1870s, eight, maybe 1850, it starts going up. It's the hockey stick, same graph, whatever. Okay, so I'm just saying that there are new inputs into history that are reflected in these graphs that show an amazing rate of change just within decades. There's nothing long about this durée. This is really short. So something is screwed up. The takeoff point of environmental change is no longer centuries, it's decades. Here are some others. These are, these are uh, all graphs of energy systems. But I'm just showing, you know, it's the shape that, that I'm asking you to look at. So 
that's an incredible change in how history works. Something is going on that's different. And the fact that you call something an industrial revolution, that's a term from 1884, on uh, the model of the French Revolution shows that by the late 1800s, people are beginning to realize that something is happening in history that hasn't happened before. And it has to do with environmental change. Okay, but at the same time, deceleration is also happening. Um, there are events that you used to think happened and were over, and they take a much longer time. They are never over. And my, of course, my favorite example, and anybody's example, is the financial crisis of 2008. Is it over? I mean, officially, but um, I'm a member of a workshop that Manuel Castells has organized, uh, meeting at the Gulbenkian Foundation and being supported by the Gulbenkian Foundation about uh, and the title of the workshop is The Aftermath of the Financial Crisis. It's not the crisis. We're studying the aftermath. And it's, th it's almost three years and we're still studying it. And we're not close to feeling that that event is over. So that's the aftermath network. And I'm just, th you know, it made me start thinking about other events that are never over. So I think in retrospect, the presidential election of 2000 was was a really a bellwether. I mean, was Bush elected or not? I mean, it went on for weeks. You know, you wake up and usually you have an election and it happens. This went on and on and on. Um, so Obama gets elected, but the minute you know you have another election, well, then you're going to repeal health care, which was a signature accomplishment of his first half of his first term. Um, if you you know, if you do something in politics now, there's a sense of, well, you may get the majority, but now you need a supermajority. Well, we're going to have a recall election. We're going to repeal this. I mean, when is something decided? And I don't have to mention, of course, in military affairs. That's, you know, Joe Haldeman's uh, title of his book about Vietnam, the forever war. You know, it could be Vietnam. It could be Iraq. It certainly could be Afghanistan. And as we get into the so-called end game of Iraq, you know, quoting Dexter Filkins, you know, the, the question is, you know, when does the end game end? So I just point, I point out that there are aftermaths now. History seems to be slowing down. It's getting like molasses. It's like the oil spill. Um, and I'll just point out the aftermath, again, if you look up the meaning of the word, it's if you mow a lawn, the aftermath is what grows up after you mow, and then you have to mow it again. Uh, and the, uh, one of the first uses of the term that really struck me is John Hersey's use of it. When he, you know, he wrote Hiroshima the year after the bomb was dropped, he went back 40 years later, interviewed the same people and, and their sur and the surviving families. That's called aftermath. 40 years later, the bomb is still being dropped. So why is this? Why? I mean, this sounds contradictory. Things are happening much faster and they're happening much slower. Uh, and I say the answer is the same answer, that we're working in a new historical medium. In other words, it's not so much the time constant, it's the density of human presence on the planet, which both speeds up environmental change and slows down political change. Uh, and I, here I call it the viscosity. Uh, things move slower in political affairs, but in environmental affairs, the human presence is much more immediate because it's just much denser. So it's, I'm making the claim that we are not dealing here with a matter of how you report differently. I'm saying history is working differently. And journalists and historians both have to take account of that. And this is the chart that really shows the story. When I'm talking about density and viscosity of human presence, that's what I mean. That's the big one. So it makes it very hard for historians to be reflective uh, when things are moving much faster for historians. Um, you know, the saying of historians is the owl of Minerva of wisdom, Athena's owl, takes wing only at the dusk when the day is over. But what if the day is never over? What if it just keeps going? If the sun never sets on history, then historians are really challenged. There's also the problem, the human problem, that understanding for all of us, not just historians, comes with an ending, with a story that has an end, as, as Appleby says. 
stories start with an end. We have to, we have to understand the story in that context. So if it's a never-ending story, then you don't understand the world. You don't understand human life. Um, people need a sense of an ending. And that's um, the title of a very famous book of literary criticism by Cremona, who actually just talked about an ending. He just died recently, which sent me back to the book, which made me realize how pertinent it is storytelling in fiction for this idea of an ending. So Kermode talks about the idea of crisis having been imminent, that there's some ending that's imminent and says now it's just, it, there's an imminence to it. In other words, it's not impending or near at hand. It's just like that sense of things going on and on and maybe ending but never quite ending, that's become something constant, something we live with. Uh, and I just point out, this goes back to that OED um, slide I showed you earlier. Just tucked in it was another, you know, another literary critic, William Empson. In 1940, you know, at the, at the edge of the war, saying, you know, this is a, there is a crisis feeling. And we, the point is to join it up to what we experience in everyday life. So a slow-moving crisis, the slowest-moving crisis is just saying it's everyday life. This is an image of crisis. This is actually a famous, let's see, this is Angelus Novus. This is a Paul Clay watercolor now in Jerusalem. And it's most famous not from Clay's watercolor, but from what Walter Benjamin said about this watercolor. And I'm going to read it to you. He says, Benjamin says, this is the angel of history. This is the angel of history. Uh, it shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned to the past. When we perceive a chain of events, where we perceive a chain of events, the angel sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay. He would like to awaken the dead and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing in from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such a violence that the angel can no longer close his wings. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned. While the pile of debris before him grows skyward, this storm is what we call progress. So in progress it's assumed that we humans are running this never-ending cycle of improvement, never-ending process of improvement. But what I've tried to say today is that cycle has two effects uh, that are new. One is it speeds up events, environmental events, so they feel now like nature, but nature on speed literally. It also makes us feel that change is out of control because things never really change. Politics is clogged up and so even though we try to act, nothing happens. So my ending plea is to avoid the grand illusion of reification which means that things and technologies and items and you know the stuff of the world um, that they are making things different. What's making things different is human dominance as never before. And so the story for journalists for any crisis, slow or fast moving, is not so much the pace, it's who's responsible, who's acting, pointing to the people and not to the stuff of history. So that's it. Thank you, Ross. That was wonderful. Um, taking notes as fast as you could speak. Um, okay. Uh, that talk is an example of why I wanted to have a, a few, few moments for questions right now because there's a, there's a richness to it that if you have an immediate reaction or question, could you please come up to one of the mics as this is being recorded and that will enable us to get your brilliant words on the tape and ask, ask Ross. Thank you. That was terrific. It stitches so many things together that haven't stitched together well. Here's a question. Have we gone from assembly line storytelling to a world that defies that and so we need relational storytelling 
which would suggest we map things mm. and show the actors and the effects in real time over time and we can go back and forth and see how somebody did something over here and it changed things over here. In other words, it's what the systems engineering department would look at and say that system in engineering storytelling. Yeah. And then you fit out all the facts in and all the stuff of the moment so you can rock back and forth over time. You know, my, my trade, if I have to define it, is called history of technology. And in history of technology, there's a big um, trend or uh, technique called actor network theory, okay? And, and just what you're saying, you, you kind of make a huge map of actors, some of which can be human and some of which can be institutional and some can be non-human. And the idea is to fit them all together. And it's very similar to the systems analysis that, that ESD and others would, would uh, undertake. I think it's very useful, but I've, I have uh, caution, two cautions. One is that if you draw that kind of a map, very often you're avoiding the decision about causality and who's really responsible, and it allows you to fudge it. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second thing is people are different because people have consciousness. And I know that you know, non-conscious actors are important, but uh, I refuse to put them all in the same soup. So just a quick follow-up. Maybe what we have to see is emergent. Maybe what history teaches us is the pattern over time. Um, if you've ever had a kid in soccer, you play a soccer game for them fast, and they see the patterns of attack mm -hmm. and regrouping. But in normal time, to a kid who doesn't know soccer, they don't know what they're looking at. Just a thought. No, I, I, and I think the, uh, the technique of mapping processes and especially in dynamic mapping where you, where you speed things up, it's really, really useful precisely in helping answer questions of causality. And if you'll excuse the word responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's exactly what I'm afraid gets lost when you, you know, when it's only, you know, a big system that's drawn. But you have an open exploration of what might have Hi happened. It's a heuristic device, yeah. Great, thank you. Could you please identify yourself? Sure, Mark Tomizawa, Six Degrees of Innovation. We're mapping social and trust and competency served for instant neural networks that could get things done quickly without coercion, which includes without money, without formal organizational structures. So mm -hmm. I'd love to continue the conversation. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks. I'm Peter Waltz with Global Narratives Incorporated. Um, my question is, when you speak of viscosity, are you speaking of the size of the human population or of the complexity and collisions that result from that, com that size? In other words? Uh, yeah, bo both. The, the, just the extensifi extensification and intensification just, uh, I mean, actually, that, that word was I, I came up with it this morning because I was trying to find something different from um, time constant, which is also a, a, you know, kind of a physics analogy. My husband uh, studied chemical engineering here, so I said, viscosity, does that say it? Is that, you know, he said, yeah, that's close enough. So, that's, <laughs> so this is a very loose uh, analogy, but I'm trying to get the sense of the thickness of the human presence right. and, you can and as a property of a medium. Like yeah. the thickness of, of Shanghai. and population density, and you can also think of the thickness of human populations because of communications. Exactly. We're now interacting in ways exactly. with um, uh, fundam Islamic fundamentalists and, and um, the southern hemisphere and the interior of Africa and um, the Gulf Coast and so on right. in all sorts of ways that we're not. It's, it's not sheer numbers. Past. It's also the, the all these interrelations. I mean, the other the other analogy I was thinking of is that great scene in um, Close Encounters where Richard Dreyfuss is is sculpting mashed potatoes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Says this means something. I know this means, and I and I feel like when humanity is more like mashed potatoes than like a liquid. You know, it's it, it's just a different medium anyway. But but let's play with this some more. This is just a. Uh, proposal. Thank you, Roz. Thank you, questioners. Um, now on to uh, talk number two. Abram Lustgardner. I'm sorry. Uh, I really am having trouble today, and I apologize to everyone, especially to Abram, whose name I butchered in every way possible. Abram Lustgarten uh, is an investigative reporter for ProPublica, 
and he has uh, been focused on uh, oil and gas industry uh, investigative work. Uh, he's got a wonderful uh, background in dead tree journalism, which is where I got started, and it's, it's a great thing to be involved in. He was a staff writer and contributor for Fortune, and he's written for New Media Salon, Old Media Esquire, The Washington Post, The New York Times, um, and he has a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University. Um, he's worked in long form. He's an author of the book China's Great Train, Beijing's Drive West, and the Campaign to Remake Tibet, um, which had MacArthur Foundation funding. And he's working on a new book, uh, tentatively titled Run to Failure, about BP's management culture and the years leading up to the oil spill in the Gulf. I'm sure if you press him on it, you'll, he'll talk about BP, but he's got some other things to tell us about some work that he's, he's uh, driving forward right now. So please, Abram. Thanks very much. Um, I gave you a little bit of red herring, but I am going to uh, stay focused on, on BP, I think, and, uh, and <laughs> we, can, uh, we can diverge afterwards. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, so thank you for having me. Uh, I wanted to start by uh, just telling you a little bit about ProPublica, the organization that I work for, uh, in part because nobody knows much about it, and, and it's also very relevant to, uh, to what I'll say about our reporting process. Uh, it's a it's a nonprofit and it's uh, focused on investigative journalism and it was founded in 2008 uh, with the, the purpose of uh, enhancing accountability, uh, a very idealistic goal, uh, and and in particular to do that at a time when uh, when uh, newspaper budgets were shrinking and uh, most of the uh, function of the journalism community was uh, contracting and, and going in exactly the opposite direction that we wanted to go uh, go in. Uh, our stories are, are all published under Creative Commons license and, and the idea is to give them away for free and disseminate them as widely as possible and uh, just to increase transparency and, uh, and spread our, our work. Uh, we cover finance and environment and, uh, and energy and national security and, and most of the typical beats. Um, I mention that now because it affords a certain amount of, uh, of flexibility uh, and funding and, uh, and leeway to do uh, creative reporting and very long-term reporting projects, which is essentially what I will uh, describe as, as one way to deal with covering a, a slowly unfolding crisis. Um, so since I started with ProPublica, I've covered essentially uh, two topics, uh, and it's taken me over almost three years, and just give you a sense of how slowly that, that goes. Uh, one is, uh, is natural gas drilling, and in particular the topic of hydraulic fracturing and the environmental impacts of that. Uh, and that's what I was deciding at the last moment not to, to talk about in, uh, <laughs> in prepared remarks, but, uh, but would be happy to talk about it uh, in questions. And, and the second, as you've heard, is, um, is BP and, and the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, both are, are relevant to, to this conversation. Uh, but in, in talking about uh, my coverage of BP and the oil spill, I, I wanted to focus a bit more on our decision-making process uh, as opposed to, to the actual reporting techniques because I found it uh, a little bit more, well, I thought more interesting in terms of uh, an approach to, to slow-moving crisis, but I'm happy to, again, to talk about the actual reporting uh, if it comes up later. Uh, so I wanted to start by telling you how we covered the spill in the Gulf. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of, of several ways to, to cover this idea of a slow-moving news event. Um, when we looked at the events unfolding in the Gulf, first of all, we, we got in late. Uh, you know, the the uh, explosion on the rig had happened and, and the spill had begun, and about two weeks later we decided that we would actually cover this, which isn't uh, exactly breaking news pacing. Um, we didn't want to jump into this pool of, of daily coverage, uh, in part because we're uh, still a growing website, uh, still uh, working hard to, to seek partnerships and, and outlets to publish our stories, and everybody was there covering it, and um, there was a great breadth of, of very thorough uh, journalism already taking place, and, and we wanted to both do something more creative and, and also find a niche where, uh, where we would actually make a contribution. Uh, so it was a mixture of self-interest and also uh, trying to find a deeper way to, to cover this story. Uh, but uh, the, the non-self-interested non side uh, of us was looking for, uh, for a new opportunity in, in our approach. Um, so we sat down and, and raised some very early questions uh, about 
what was the disaster, what was the nature of the disaster that we're looking at, and was it as obvious as what we were seeing in the headlines of, of the papers on a daily basis at that point? Um, there were very clear, obvious, uh, uh, tangible crisis that we could latch onto. There was the explosion itself. Um, there were the, the deaths of 11 workers. Uh, there was the subsequent sinking of, of the Deepwater Horizon rig, and then um, the, the spill and the blowout preventer and the actual gushing of, of oil into the water and, and all of that kind of immediate environmental crisis. Um, we started to realize quickly through talking about all of this that, uh, that none of those things were, were what uh, were particularly interesting to us or uh, or opened the, the kind of opportunities that we were looking for. Uh, and uh, what we wanted to, to focus on was was more in the background uh, to varying degrees, was was the slower moving part of, of this crisis. I think all those other aspects were relatively fast moving uh, things happening over, over a long period of time. Uh, so we considered things like uh, the story of inadequate regulation by the government, uh, which did ultimately get quite a bit of, of good attention and exploration in the press. Uh, we, we were interested in the complicated history uh, of BP, uh, its track record, and, and how that might be an indicator of, of what kind of culpability there should be for this company. Uh, we're interested, of course, in the environmental catastrophe in a, in a longer term uh, sense than just looking at, uh, at oil slicks on the surface of the water. And I was personally very interested in, in what this uh, what this accident meant in terms of uh, the slowest moving interpretation of this, which is the question of you know what kind of risk are we as a society assuming, or do we understand the risks that we assume environmentally when we uh, have the kind of energy demands and uh, energy intensive lifestyles that that we maintain. Uh, the, there's a little bit of a wake up call in what happened in the Gulf about. Um, what kind of uh, risks we do assume and what we can expect to happen in terms of crisis in the future. Uh, it turns out that uh, we chose one path uh, and we were equally interested in each of those and I, we ended up looking at um, the history of BP, uh, BP's management and the topic of the book that I'm working on as, as you just heard about. Uh, it was an exercise in, in commitment, in part because we were uh, torn and not especially decisive about which of those avenues would be the most fruitful. Um, I spent the next six months reporting on BP's management, on the company's culture issues, cultural issues, and, uh, and eventually presented that work through uh, a series of newspaper reports, uh, shorter blog postings on our website, and uh, television collaboration with, with PBS Frontline. Uh, to do that reporting, uh, it, it, interesting in the context of, of our last conversation, because I essentially went back and, and took a historical perspective and worked up until the present, as opposed to working with the present forward. Uh, we worked around the perimeter of this issue of what was happening in the Gulf, and uh, and, and thereby found a lot of space in terms of competition with, with other media. Uh, we were uh, extraordinarily dependent on, on documents, on, on uh, uh, archives of past congressional hearings and transcripts and depositions from previous lawsuits against BP and, and in, a, in a close analysis of accidents that the company had had in the past and essentially looked for context in those events uh, to help explain what we were learning about what was happening in the present that the New York Times and the Daily Papers were doing a great job of, of showing up at the hearings on a daily basis and repeating whatever, uh, whatever was being uh, told there. Um, and we knew from the beginning uh, that, that to tell a story with this uh, somewhat uh, less sexy material would, would require a really intensive narrative focus uh, and a little bit of, of narrative uh, depth to, uh, to keep it interesting and to, to engage uh, our readers. Uh, so the verdict is out on, on whether that was effective or not. I hope that it was. Uh, but one of the things that was interesting uh, for me, it was throughout that process, it was very difficult for, for both me and for ProPublica to stay committed to that track. And, and I think it's one of the lessons about trying to cover a slow moving crisis in that way. Um, we had many moments of, of feeling you know, torn away uh, as the story changed directions, as we had uh, insight or scoops into very incremental changes uh, that, could, that could grab a daily headline but, but distract us from this, this larger purpose of, of creating a, a bigger picture and a bigger sense of context. Uh, and uh, it was very difficult to just stay focused on what we had decided to do and, and to, to, to simply see it through. And it, it was really an exercise uh, in, in discipline. Um, 
I hope that, that the final product uh, winds up give, uh, lending a, a sense of depth and breadth uh, that uh, can capture the imagination of, of an audience and, um, and can convey news uh, through a lot of old events in that it, uh, it shares a context and, and presents a picture that really nobody else was, was looking at uh, as events unfolded in the Gulf. And, uh, and, and therefore find something new in uh, a collection of things that were actually very old. Um, so it brings me to the, the core of the challenge that I think that we uh, face, just speaking very generally in, in covering these sorts of issues uh, it, that uh, sort of state the obvious a little bit, but the public and, and to some extent the government uh, and even, even big business um, <clears throat> seems very unable to to comprehend uh, threats that are that are further out that are out of reach or or kind of fuzzy on the on the horizon. Um, coverage of climate change is is a good example of that. Uh, this issue of the risks of of energy dependence and exploration that I mentioned, uh, and then and certainly uh, the the uh, issue of trying to to comprehend the the long term environmental implications of something like the Gulf spill. Um, we know both as, as reporters and I think as, as the public, uh, we know on some cerebral level that, that there's a real concern there, uh, that there's something that we should be interested in, but it's still very difficult to, uh, to feel concerned and, and as, a, as a reporter to, to then convey that concern, um, in part because uh, we get in the habit of and, and in some sense need this, this sense of, uh, you know, an anchor uh, or an example or, or an event, an, of an, uh, an immediacy to, to tell the story. Uh, and so in the case of, of the Gulf environmental story, uh, we tend to cling to daily developments uh, of oil on the beaches or oil on birds or, or strong visual images um, that again make it very difficult to actually consider what I think the, the, the uh, real substance of the environmental story is, which is a much longer term uh, intangible topic. Um, but we know or we, or we should know uh, that telling that deeper story, the, the one that we might have an aversion to, will take many months, uh, if not years, and uh, that, w that when we do tell it or when you do read it, uh, it will be about something that's happening at, at a microscopic level uh, or even invisibly, you know, somewhere in the food chain or somewhere in incremental shifts in, in air quality uh, figures or something like that. Um, it, it, w we should know up front that, that it will uh, never be the same kind of headline grabbing uh, incident or, or disaster uh, that, that uh, makes for, for easy reading. Um, so the challenge is, is again, whether it's through narrative or, or multimedia uh, or, uh, or, or whatever, to, uh, to it ha is how to get people interested or excited in this, in this quote unquote soon to be urgent or, you know, or near future issue um, that, that we kind of know is important but, but uh, have difficulty conveying the, its importance. Uh, and, and the fact that we're surrounded uh, by this overwhelming sense of, of urgency in every other matter at every other moment uh, doesn't make it any easier that, that we work in this environment, uh, you know, a flood of data uh, and information that um, I think confuses all of us about what actually is urgent in the present and what is a crisis in the present. So. Through that, uh, that deliberation, uh, there are a lot of topics that can tend to slip through the cracks, and, and in this sense, the Gulf environmental issue is one of them. Uh, I mean, where is this Gulf environment story now? Uh, from an ecological standpoint, this is probably the most critical stage. Uh, now, months after the, the spill, uh, it, we might finally be able to actually begin to see what the effects are on, on the ecology in the Gulf uh, and observe where, uh, where the chemicals and the oil have, have reached. But it, this is the moment when, uh, when coverage of that issue has tapered off to, to a virtual standstill. Um, it's lost its appeal at, at exactly the moment when, um, when I think that the story is potentially beginning. Um, and, and the reason for that is, is that the Gulf uh, never, uh, never provided uh, the kind of a visual disaster that, uh, that, say, the Exxon Valdez spill did, which is what can uh, maintain that momentum and, and, and that public interest. So what is the solution? I, uh, the, one of the things that ProPublica has tried to do uh, 
is, is address two challenges. Uh, one is uh, to keep people engaged, and, and two is to convey this, this large sense of uh, this, this total body work, the, the collective uh, impact of a lot of stories as opposed to one or two or, or three singular blockbuster stories. Uh, and, and I think that one effective way to do this is to create a bit of a drumbeat of, of communication. Uh, and it's something that we've been experimenting with quite a bit, and that's to, rather than having, uh, you know, one uh, critical climax to six months of reporting, uh, we will uh, repeatedly uh, publish again and again and again in incremental bits uh, in addition to, to a large feature story. And, and somehow by uh, just reiterating our point or our findings on a, on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, it can find a, a pathway through the, through the sort of clamor uh, that's so distracting. Um, so in, in our experience in the Gulf, we decided early on uh, that it would take a, a combination of, of many articles uh, and, in, and in some cases a, a blog approach. And uh, we, we, at the same time that we had those early discussions about how, what aspects of the Gulf story we wanted to cover, uh, we decided, uh, we staffed to do both of these, kind of, both of these uh, avenues kind of separately. Uh, we created a daily blogger uh, who would uh, work on, on one part of that drumbeat and uh, create a steady stream of, of provocative and revealing stories and also point uh, to other news coverage uh, in a way that, uh, that put them in the tone in the context of, of our larger project. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I embarked on our, uh, on our longer, longer form reporting project, which wound up in, in as I mentioned, a, a couple longer, longer features in this television partnership. Um, this is where, uh, this is something that, that I think ProPublica has been uniquely able to, to do, uh, to experiment with uh, because of our freedom and, and our funding and our lack of time pressure uh, and, and the form of our media. Uh, it, we don't have printing press costs. Uh, we uh, are, are fortunate to have very deep funding and I'm fortunate to have editors who, who aren't demanding uh, anything more of me than, than I see a story through until it reaches its kind of organic closure. Uh, and that's something that uh, I think is absolutely essential to covering uh, a crisis like what's happening in the Gulf or, or any crisis as you define it where, uh, where it will take a, a long-term engagement uh, like my natural gas coverage, which has been a, a two and a half year project. Uh, and so the thought uh, that I would leave you on is that, uh, uh, that like what ProPublica has allowed me to do, coverage of these kind of, of crisis in, uh, in general requires an extraordinary amount of, 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 uh, of depth and commitment and resources. And, and part of why it's been difficult to get uh, good coverage of these kind of events these days is because those resources are diminishing at, at most other uh, publications and outlets that are out there. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I was, when I heard that two and a half years on a story, I'm thinking, I can't remember the last time I heard a mainstream media publication devote that kind of resource to a story. It needs to happen all the time, much more than it does. Questions? Any immediate questions? Yes, I see one coming. Tell us who you are, Chris. Uh, sure. I'm Chris Tuxemi. I direct the Center for Future Civic Media here. And um, I, I guess the main question I have to ask is you, you, you talked a little bit about the contrast with the natural gas stories. Um, but, you know, the natural gas stories don't yet have that kind of single coherent event. And, you know, how, uh, how, uh, how did that process start? How did you decide to prioritize that? And how have you seen um, other organ news organizations respond to that to that kind of slow moving crisis? So the alternative lecture that yeah. I, that I might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean that's why I was indecisive about which of these topics to uh, to convey today. I mean they're very different in that uh, the Gulf was a very defined crisis, and we were uh, a very defined crisis that was going to take place over a long period of time. Uh, we knew the coverage would drop off, and we were looking for a creative way to take that long approach. Uh, gas drilling is the complete opposite. It wasn't much of an issue at all until I began covering it. Uh, and, and long after I began covering it, uh, it, it was very, very difficult to both get people's attention for it and, and uh, get some legitimacy. It happened to coincide with the launching of ProPublica and, um, and we hadn't uh, established uh, ourselves in terms of credentials or a track record of stories. Uh, 
to back up for uh, for two seconds, I mean, the the topic is is essentially looking at whether new technology to extract natural gas uh, from uh, new uh, gas bearing formations in the United States uh, can harm drinking water, uh, both underground and and uh, as the, the chemicals that are used in this process are disposed of or handled on the surface. And uh, generally, I've found that they can, but I'm not a scientist, and I've been sort of pushing the the questioning in, in that direction and looking for, for more research and, and more study on, on that topic. Uh, so that in a way is a, is, a, is a much better example, I think, of a slow moving crisis and it hasn't yet uh, reached its, its climax or, uh, or any kind of definitive turning point and I think that maybe that's happening now. Uh, and it's also a better example of, of this kind of drumbeat approach that I, that I mentioned where uh, First, no one listened, or first, no one understood, and then there was resistance to listening. Uh, then there were questions about the legitimacy of the reporting, and and uh, a little bit of a of a battle of, uh, of you know between uh, what I was finding and what um, the industry might communicate, um, you know, through their PR channels. And then finally, a a a, a resonance that that led to a to an acceptance that this was a legitimate issue and and kind of a, a, a reaching of a critical mass where where other media started covering it and it's and it became the subject of, of documentary films and uh, and television programs and um, and fiction and nonfiction and uh, and and it's reaching a general awareness where I think that there's enough uh, enough focus now on the problems to start taking seriously the question of, of what is the actual risk and, and what might we do might we do to mitigate it. Uh, so uh, it's a very, very slow moving crisis that has yet to, to become a crisis. It's more of a warning of a crisis. So Andrew Whitaker from the Center for Future Civic Media. I guess combining your talk and Roz's, um, whether it was ever true or not, the uh, traditional like Metro Daily um, thought of itself as covering everything, um, whether it was sports to city council to federal government, whatever. Um, ProPublica has decided that it's going to focus on particular topics. Um, so A, how does ProPublica go about choosing what it's going to cover, si since it doesn't try to cover everything or claim to? Um, and then B, how do you decide when you're done with the story? Um, if you've been working on something for two and a half years, you put a lot of resources into it, um, with the Metro Daily, you know, the, the, the news event ends and they go on to something else. But how would you decide, all right, we've done enough on this or we've accomplished our goal or how do you decide that? Yeah, I, I don't have good answers to either one of those questions. It's, uh, it's very organic. Uh, we generally do uh, stories according to the interests of the reporters who are, who are working there. Uh, a lot of reporters came to ProPublica with uh, with expertise in a certain area, and I came with an interest in, in environment and water issues. And it was it was through early reporting on that that I stumbled on this this topic of hydraulic fracturing. Um, so so we've taken a very uh, kind of serendipitous approach of you know whatever seems to be uh, allowing us to move forward and whatever continues to prove interesting, we'll continue to report on without necessarily saying well, we have to have uh, you know 15 environmental stories and 15 national security stories in in the six month period. Um, and that might change as as we go forward and and the holes in our coverage are more easy to identify uh, but but that's the way it's been for for the first two years or two and a half years of, of our existence and as as to when you're done uh, uh, I mean in some sense you could never be done i I've been uh, super saturated with this issue of of gas drilling uh, for a long time and, and eager to move on from it uh, and and the Gulf spill was one opportunity to do that. Uh, but like I was saying, the, the issue has taken on a, a little bit of a, of, uh, of a life of its own lately and, and that's starting to mean that it's not done and rather than moving on to 10 other things that I've been anxious to cover, we'll probably go back to it and, um, and uh, we'll work on it further. Uh, so we've, there's a couple different ways of evaluating that. I mean, if you go back to our mission statement, it's it's to to bring attention to uh, to issues that other news organizations aren't uh, focusing on, uh, and so I guess on some technical level that means that if we've raised uh, the level of conversation enough that it's carrying on on its own, then we don't have to hang around and facilitate it for too much longer. Uh, that obviously tends to conflict with um, 
you know, the competitive nature of, of a reporter and wanting to own a story and also the level of expertise that you get after a long period of time. And um, so it becomes this, this fight between, you know, do you stay in and, and say something a little bit smarter or deeper than, than the next person at every turn or do you step back and kind of move on to the next topic? We haven't figured out how to answer that yet. Thank you. More chances for question coming up shortly, but I want to make sure that we have the luxury of relaxed time to get through our program because Andrea Pitzer has some ex you know, extremely important stuff to tell us. Um, she's somebody who thinks deeply about uh, technique and practice, uh, how to do story in new media. Not in new media, in this new environment, not exclusively in new media, which is a terrible term anyway, but in this new environment where we have this enormous spectrum of media, we have a wide spectrum of audiences, a wide spectrum of expectations. Um, and Andrea at uh, the Neiman Foundation with her Neiman Storyboard Project uh, is one of the people really at the heart of the question about how to proceed in this area. Now, Andrea did send me some stuff for her uh, bio. It's, she's got an incredibly distinguished career. She's, she's uh, uh, done work across uh, you know, an enormous range of topics. She's currently researching uh, on SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, the legacy of American eugenics, and Vladimir Nabokov, which is not a triplet that I expected to say tonight. Yeah, it's not one story. Those are different I, yeah, yeah, I, I did get that. So I was trying to allow them. But, you know, she did also send me the following sentence. So I'm just going to, and, and inevitably, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, these are the details with which I will end her introduction. She wrote to me, if you want some details on the lighter side, I have a black belt in karate, once helped foil an armed robbery, and ate only Pop-Tarts for a month as part of a pretty abysmal experiment. Andrea, please. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about um, ways that we might communicate in, uh, when reporting on these simmering or long-term crises. And not surprisingly, given my job, um, I have an interest in narratives and story and the role that storytelling plays in how we might cover these things. But first up, uh, what is a story? You can put your hand out up if you, what is it, what elements do you need to have to have a story? Uh, any takers? Anybody? What, what do you need to have a story? Oh, if you're going to be shy, I have prizes. Okay. Uh, no, 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 you don't get to find out what the prize is first. What, what is your answer? Where, why, and best, how? Okay, well let's break it down even further. All right, so who? We'll start with who. You have to have some characters. Okay, so hold on. I'll give out the prizes later, okay, but it's cookies. Or you can have, or you can have Play-Doh, if you like Play-Doh better. I've got cookies and Play-Doh. Okay, so you need <laughs> characters. What else do you need? So, a, a setting. Who, who said location? Did you say location? No. Oh, so you're supposed to put your hand up. So I'll think about cookies for you if I have enough. And what else? Structure helps. Uh, yeah, structure definitely helps. There's one other key thing you need. You need characters and a setting, and you need... An audience. Oh, you know what? I didn't even sort of think of it, but yes, you, that's what this is all about. You need, you're going to get like double cookies for that, okay? And Megan, what else do you need? Movement through time. Movement through time. And that can be uh, a change in events. That can be a change in the past that you hit at that point in your story. Or that can be uh, the possibility of change. Sometimes simply that a possibility is open or something is offered. Um, but there has to be some implication that, that you're going to go from A to B. And so those are the key things that you have to have to have a story in place. And, um, you know, if we think of, has everybody here seen Star Wars? I was trying to think of a movie that everybody would have seen, like no matter what generation you're from. We have Luke, right? We have Tatooine. He finds the droids. So we've got characters. We've got a setting. And then he sees the holograph of Princess Leia. And that's the point at which something is going to happen. So whatever comes next, we've got a whole story there. And so those are the things that you have to have to make a story function. And so why does story matter? Um, why story matters is because story is what moves public opinion. So if we're talking about covering long-term crises or addressing or reporting on long-term crises, we need to be having stories that people can have these elements and recognize these elements and understand what we're telling them. Um, and story is really what makes for effective news delivery. I'll talk a little bit later about what I call empty calorie narratives. So I'm not just talking about puff pieces or a profile of the congressman that says everything nice about him. I'm talking about real reporting. But story is a really critical element of it. And um, studies have shown pretty consistently. Now some of these studies were more or less rigorous, but every study that I've seen 
has shown in the 70s, in the 90s, uh, two years ago in Scandinavia, um, most recently with a, a fellow that's at another program, um, an ethics, the ethics program at Harvard, um, showing that narrative is really how people understand public crises, it's how they understand public policy issues, and that by not giving them narratives, uh, we are in some ways denying them the ability to understand what we're saying. Um, most recently, this uh, fellow at the Safer Center, Michael Jones, has noted that, uh, and you guys can hear me, right? Okay, so it's the computer, not the mic, all right. Um, he has not studied journalism directly, but his cohorts have, and uh, he, his own work with them has looked at taking the same information and presenting it in different ways, and uh, only changing about 25% of the material. So it's the same information, more or less but one is in a story form, one is more of a bulleted list of facts. Uh, you can imagine these different, the ways you consume news, if you will. Um, and what he's found is that very, very consistently that the narrative is what uh, gets people's attention, gets them to buy into the information that they're getting. Uh, the other studies have found that people actually retain more for longer, given these kinds of structures. And uh, the studies done by Jones collaborators, um, their own work has shown that in fact a lot of news narratives that are not necessarily structured in the way that you think of narrative storytelling uh, still have all those elements, they're still functioning as news narratives, and that um, even if the journalists aren't aware they're presenting the information that way, they're actually using a lot of narrative models. And so part of what he's calling for is a much greater awareness of journalists uh, in how narrative functions and how they may actually be advocating for policies in their stories and not even be aware of it. Um, and I think that as we are more and more aware of how story works and doesn't work, uh, it's going to be more incumbent on us to resolve some of these issues of advocacy and transparency and things that have come up. Um, but we're not going to be able to sort of turn back the clock and pretend like we don't know what these stories are that we're telling. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about you know, why is story relevant? Because this is the way the general public uh, can sort of most access these stories and most comprehend these stories. And there are risks of using a storytelling model in this long-term simmering crises that we're talking about, and I, I don't want to pretend that, there aren't, that it isn't problematic. Um, particularly if we're addressing technological issues, um, right now a lot of the people who can make and tell and disseminate their stories are people with access to pretty advanced technology and networks to do so. And so I think one of the things that we'll have to be looking at is where are these stories coming from. And certainly a number of people already are, and I'll be highlighting a couple projects where people are looking for voices that we don't necessarily hear and getting the stories that we don't to help fill out the narratives that we can do through our own investigative work and talking to people. Um, but also sometimes your target isn't the general public. And in that case, you may be dealing with a cohort of people that are pretty suspicious of story. Um, in fact, there's a number of journalists that are suspicious of story. It's like, well, if you're telling me a story, then you must be trying to sell me something. And so I'm going to be resistant to that. And particularly if you're looking to establish your authority within a certain community of people that you want to get to respond to you, particularly if it's a research community or an industry community, and uh, you're trying to reach across the aisle or you're just trying to inform them. And I'm speaking here not about journalism, but about I know many of you are also involved in public communications and other aspects. Um, but even in journalism, sometimes the target audience for you know, a publication on the Hill is not every living room in America. It's the people that are working on the Hill. And so I do think you have to be aware of your audience. Um, but I don't think that you want to abandon story if you're not going for a general public. I think you just want to uh, tilt more heavily to um, somebody in a meeting a little bit ago was calling stories with teeth. You know, you might put more teeth in the story uh, for an audience that, that already understands the basic problem that you're presenting. And you want to get, make sure you get the data and the information across more thoroughly and more deeply to convince them that you have a legitimate story to tell. Um, also, one of the issues in a lot of classic narrative storytelling, and uh, I'm thinking, you know, Black Hawk Down, and to give you guys all a, you know, that's the classic narrative journalism. It ran in the Philadelphia Inquirer. I think it was a 21 installment series. I mean, you don't see a lot of projects like that now, but there's a big narrative, uh, text heavy, research intensive project. Um, but a lot of those classic narratives really only involve, and, and Black Hawk Down is actually an exception, but uh, one or two people. You really focus very intensely. And sometimes, 
uh, one of the issues with storytelling is that one or two people may not be really representative. Um, and so part of what I think is exciting about some of the new media opportunities is that we can actually access and follow and reflect more experiences. Even if we may hone in on one or two people, um, there's a way to include other stories so that we can make apparent what the larger story frame is, even if we're telling one piece of that. Uh, and so I think that's an important thing to be aware of is that, you know, you, you know Islam in Indonesia, you know, you're probably not going to pick one person who's going to be able to completely personify that in a, in a meaningful way on every subject. Um, and the other thing that happens in some of the new media frontiers is uh, that you can create a story, but you don't necessarily get to keep control of it. Um, there's sort of two directions this goes. You can invite other people in to add content to something that you've created, but your story can also become part of somebody else's uh, view, whether it's the person at home who's reading or viewing your story, or whether it's somebody who's actually doing their own reporting. And there's a lot more cross-reporting. Uh, it used to be you worked at a daily newspaper, you never mentioned the competition. Well, now online you start to see some of these walls falling down and people will cite other people's work as they add their own piece to the next part of it. Um, but where this can kind of be a little problematic is I think that because narrative is so powerful, because it does convince people um, and it does engage them and they remember what they read, uh, I'm thinking of the New York Times did a profile of Freeman Dyson a few months ago. Does anybody see that? Um, and basically you have this very practical minded super genius who has been right about a lot of things in his life and it was a really interesting profile and it was well reported and I don't think it was one sided at all but a, a, an important piece of what came out in it is that he's been a climate change skeptic for I, I don't remember if it's fully 30 years now but it's around 30 years. And uh, here we have, you know, certainly one of the 20th century's legendary uh, and interesting, really compelling scientific characters. And he's a climate change skeptic. And so for the uh, nugget of that piece itself in the magazine, I don't think that it's badly reported. It's certainly not badly written. But in the overall context into which that story drops, then we have, you know, there's a, a slow simmering crisis issue here that we've just added to sort of unintentionally. So I do think with narratives you have to be careful since you're dropping in a really compelling individual story, what pot are you dropping it into? And I think that that's something that does have to be kept in mind. Um, and so, but I don't want to just say it's all risky because I think storytelling actually has a really good important role. And so what are some of the uh, game changing, I'm thinking particularly here of journalism, narratives that you have read or seen, so I'm not just limiting it to text. What are some of the game-changing narratives that you can think of? Stories that came out and weren't just important, well-researched, a long time spent on them, but really the public responded to. Again, hands up, and I do have prizes, so please do come get them at the end. Okay, what else? Anybody? Game-changing narratives. Game-changing any, it doesn't even have to be narratives. Carson Silent Spring. Okay, and I'm thinking, you know, that's, that's a fabulous example. Let's go to reported stuff like, you know, in like, uh, let's say the last 30 years, okay? But that's absolutely a fabulous answer. What else? Green sweater. I'm thinking of the New York Times after September 11 where they did all those individual profiles of the people who died. Um, I don't know if it changed a game, but it had a lot of impact. So the September 11th profiles to sort of, to, to have a community yeah. understanding, processing of this event. Okay, what else? Yes. Watergate. Watergate, I think we can probably agree on that. And I mean, there's one where it's interesting because some of the individual stories weren't narratives, you know. But what a narrative. You've got undercover, you know, garages. This, I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, the fall of a presidency, it doesn't get any bigger. Really, enough, Boing Boing's coverage of WikiLeaks. Okay, the Boing Boing WikiLeaks coverage. It's probably in other places that Boing Boing broke. And, and what do you think was game changing about that? It was just, it really opened up this huge discussion about. I mean, I don't know if it was game changing in anything but the discussion of WikiLeaks, but I think it really brought to bear because there were all these like really sexy elements of it. You know, you had this particular person who was leaking military documents, and it just seemed like it brought WikiLeaks to the public eye in a way that it hadn't previously been very uh, public. Okay, great. What else? Michael Hastings' coverage of uh, Kemal McChrystal. Yeah, McChrystal. Actually, that was one of the things I had noted. I was thinking of, like the recent things. Yes. What else? Tom, did you ever get it? Yeah, uh, I'll toss. Um, there are, there are two on very different sort of 
levels. Okay. Uh, one is, of course, the Pentagon Papers because it, it changed media relationship to power and to courts. And the other is, is, is an event rather than a, a story, but it was the founding and, and very rapid initial success of People Magazine. Now, see, that's one I wouldn't thought of. So, like, that's, that's great because I think there's a lot of interesting stories out there. But if you think about those stories and why they stick in your mind, whether or not they were written out as the way you would write out a novel with all the fictional techniques, which is an important, which is the historical component of narrative journalism, there's character. You've got a really strong character and there's something happens, there's something dramatic, it has consequences. And that gets communicated by how that coverage happens. Some of the things I noted before I was coming over was um, uh, Anne Hull and Dana Priest's coverage of the Walter Reed uh, stuff in the Washington Post, the, the terrible treatment of the returning vets. Um, giant pool of money, which I cannot believe anybody in this room hasn't heard at some point in time. Uh, the New Yorker David Grand piece about the a potentially wrongful execution of Cameron Todd Willingham, which I would say has had an impact because there was just a guy with, written about in Texas Monthly that was released this month. I don't know if you saw that, but I think that's again where you have multiple stories that kind of aggregate to a bigger story that goes to uh, the kinds of stories that ProPublica does where they're stringing this clothesline across of what's the story behind all these stories so that we have a place to hang these individual pieces from and we understand the bigger part of what's happening. Um, the Abu Ghraib photos on 60 Minutes, I think, are another, you know, and this because, and it was interesting. I think that does, on the one hand, sometimes the story isn't sexy because it doesn't have the visuals. But on the other hand, sometimes, boy, if you've got the visuals, you've got the story. Because that's what they didn't want to let out. If you remember, it was written about, it was known that this happened, but the photos were the game changer. So I think sometimes the narrative can be really powerful with words, and then sometimes an image, you know, can do a lot. Uh, not necessarily totally on its own. You have to have some context for it, but you know, narratives can take place in a lot of different ways. Um, at any rate, and then I was also thinking of an inconvenient truth, which uh, Davis Guggenheim very much shaped as a narrative. Again, most of you probably seen it or at least know about it, but he kept saying to Gore, like, we can't just do the PowerPoint presentation. I want this to be about your life. And there, are, you know, and, and so, there's all this stuff from his life that's in there. And I don't think that he was comfortable with that. It's the sense that I've gotten in some of the stuff that I've read about it. Um, but I think Guggenheim knew what he was doing to make that impact. And for those of us who might be deep researchers or really like the long-term projects, um, you might be averse to that. But I'm just being practical. In terms of the big game-changing narratives, often there's a story attached or a story grows up around it. And that is why the larger public gets hold of it. So I think that it's, it's important moving forward as we cover these kinds of things to find those stories that are legitimate, ethical, responsible, representative reporting that will get to the heart of those things. Um, and there are, uh, the things that we've named are pretty much long-term traditional types of projects other than maybe boing boing <laughs> um, that people investigated and spent a lot of time on and developed as a story. Um, and so for right now, I think the most powerful narratives uh, for public policy and for journalism are still the things that we already know how to make well and the things the public knows how to engage with. Um, but I don't think that that's going to be permanently the way everything works. And there are already some promising projects where we can imagine the, uh, earlier in the meeting that some of us were at, um, talking about Ushedi, you know, there are tools where we can start networking and building communities and awareness of communities and getting information on the ground in ways that I think are already changing stories and are only going to change them more. Um, and I also think of the Washington Post extraordinary renditions uh, story where they had a network of people spotting these planes. And this is how they put the story together, was these people who spotted the planes and realized that, that these transports were happening and then they were able to identify where these prisons were. Um, and so uh, this idea of networks I think is only going to become more important uh, as time goes on. But I did want to show a few of the projects that I think in the near future there are people obviously at MIT working on some really 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 forward-looking and amazing things but I wanted to show you some things if can we get it on or no? Okay, all right, so it's a two-minute sleeper thing. All right, so if we can get that up there. 
This is um, a project that the GDP did, and it was interesting that Roz talked about the aftermath because the project that the National Film Board of Canada did was to spend a year after the collapse looking at what happens to regular Canadians. And they sent out a team of uh, photographers and videographers, and they stayed with the same people. And so these stories, the, uh, the code, I think, I think the green are the comments, and the red are the videos, and the yellow are photo essays. And so they spent a year chronicling the aftermath of this event in Canada. And the comments, people could add media themselves. They could make movies and upload it. They could just do t typical text comments on the stories. One artist actually created a graffiti series of things that were places that were featured in the film project and graffitied and it was all about the, the responsibility and who was, responsible, who was responsible for what had happened. So it was this really interesting feedback loop of their viewers that got involved. Um, and uh, I don't know, I actually wrote and asked for the final numbers from them which I didn't get and I suspect that this wasn't a, a vastly uh, participatory project but I think it's an interesting way in which making narratives when the story isn't over which is part of your challenge is telling the story if the story is still ongoing how do you do that these guys were making monthly films about the people that they had chosen to focus on that those people could see before they came back the next day to shoot footage for the next film and it's a kind of a strange way to think of this ongoing rolling narrative when you don't know what the end is because traditionally we think of story as a very shaped thing and they are looking at actually doing some of that uh, shaping and doing a longer narrative this is something called the whale hunt. I don't know if anybody's seen this, but this is, uh, I believe, a couple thousand pictures and of someone following a traditional whale hunt. So each one of those is, an, is a picture. You can watch it timeline. You can reorganize it. You can um, break it out into different chapters that it's divided into. So it's a very different way of experiencing story. And I think this is one of the things we're going to see in the future is you may craft your story, but you're going to give people uh, different ways to pull out the parts that they want that will still be a coherent story for them. Um, so this is one project that I thought was really interestingly done. And in terms of community voices telling their own stories, I don't know how many people are familiar with Global Voices, but it's like local bloggers and communities around the world, and it's a network uh, opportunity for them to get the benefits that come from being part of the group, um, but for us to hear voices on things that, and it, it's interesting if you watch this site for very long, you will realize that there are stories going on in the world that are very important to people who live in local areas that you would have no idea are really the central burning issues of their lives, even if you've been reading reporting about that country. And I think sites like this are going to become more and more important and even play into some of the kind of reporting that we're doing. Um, in terms of new formats, uh, this is TBD, which is a DC-based new news organization. But one of the things that they did recently that was interesting, and actually Megan Garber, who's here from Neiman Lab, wrote about this on Neiman uh, Journalism Lab, was this use of a tool called Storify. Um, and she didn't write about this. She wrote about her uh, own interesting take on Storify. But Storify lets you pull in social media. So people who've tweeted things, people who've posted photos, um, all different things you can pull together to create a story. Now many journalists have a heart attack when they hear this. Mm -hmm. This is like, and actually one person, I don't remember if it was on your site or on Neiman Storyboard, wrote like, you know, journalists using curated tweets, you know, for a story like, just shoot me now, was basically what they were saying. Um, but what I found fascinating about this particular take on it is that it really captured, for people who didn't know anything about the story, this timeline, there was a lot of stuff that people didn't know right in that moment and that were still questions a couple days later. And so in the midst of that, when there were still no answers and there weren't going to be answers for a couple days, TBD set this up and they pulled in tweets as reports were coming in so you could understand how it had unfolded and what people didn't know and when they didn't know it and when the news did come through. So it's recreating that narrative of how the information is evolving and how the events are changing. And now they, they've done other coverage since. That's more traditional coverage now that things have happened and it's clear. But in the moment, they didn't have that. And so they tried to create a moment-by-moment -moment breakdown of what was happening and when did they find out which elements. And you can add text into Storify. 
you can shape that story yourself. It actually was created by a former AP reporter. And I think it's a really interesting tool, and I think we'll see more of that in terms of using traditional reporting techniques but pulling in some of the networks and information from social media. One of the other things I think is going to happen is that you're going to see statistics and story being pushed closer and closer together. And our ability, you know, data visualization, data visualization, data visualization. But it's a way to have authority with communities that are data focused while still being able to push things toward a story that the public can understand. And so you have word clouds and so you have different things. And one of the things that I like about this or that's intriguing to me is that you've got, this is IBM's mini eyes, which you can go in and upload a data set and it will create a data visualization for you. I mean, it's, and there are existing data sets in there. There are already a whole bunch of them. Gapminder, which is one of the most uh, uh, interesting iterations of this, I'm going to play for you this thing just because anybody's ever seen me talk before, I apologize because I, I love this video. But here we start, this is uh, the y-axis is life expectancy, the x-axis is income per person. And these colored dots are countries of the world by region, uh, same color, our same region. And we are going through 200 years of time. So we have characters as uh, countries. Countries here are characters. We have a setting, which is our planet. And we have change over 200 years. And at the beginning, every single country starts inside this box of uh, $1,000 per person per year and 40 year lifespan. And by the end of this period of time we're moving through, everybody is outside of that. Now, I, the problem with data visualization, of course, is it's an incomplete story. Why did this happen? We don't know. But we see it looking more and more like story to where it's giving us pieces of information that people, in, people who watch 60 Minutes, that people who like you know, their Sunday comics and they want to read a story about people that they can imagine, they can connect with some of these data visualizations. And so I think that it's going to be really important uh, to be open to these new tools in addition to the traditional documentary film, in addition to the traditional text-based stories uh, as we move forward in the future. But I don't think stories' importance is going to go away. So just a few things to leave you with. Um, I think that uh, we want to get more powerful with telling visual narratives in different lengths so that we can reach different audiences. And one of the values of visual narratives is that they can cross borders a lot more easily. You need to do much less with them to be able to share them with the world. And sometimes they don't even need captioning or subtitles to be <coughs> functional. Um, I think we need to find ways to meet more people where they're at. Uh, I, I absolutely love ProPublica and I want it to continue forever and we need it. Um, and not everybody's going to have those kinds of deep pockets. And so I think that we have to, to balance the news we need to get across to people with the ways that they can understand it now and hopefully we'll find ways to do that that are financially renewable and we'll have lots and lots of uh, long-term research and reporting that's going to get to the bottoms of these things. In the meantime, I think we do need to see where can people catch and understand these stories. Even as we do string these clotheslines where we have the larger story in the background and we are providing that for readers, we are letting them see where this thing fits into the larger uh, arc, even if we're telling one piece of that story. Um, I think that we also need to figure out, and this is really, uh, I'm 40 and I think people who are 30 are already in this world and people who are 20 can't imagine another world. Um, we need to get people to have a stake in the stories. Um, you know, I'm giving you cookies for giving me answers. But, uh, you know, I mean that's a really simple version of it. <laughs> but, but people want the story to belong to them too. I think people who grow up commenting on all their friends' lives every moment of the day, and that doesn't mean you have to dumb it down, and that doesn't mean you have, these stories are relevant to their lives, and if you give them, if we are better at storytelling and making those links apparent to them, I think it'll become easier to engage them and then to become the kind of narratives where, where there's really, really good public policy outcomes, even if we ourselves as journalists may not be advocates, will be presenting information that people will really understand what their choices are in ways that, that their choices will affect what happens in the future. So there's a lot more, but I'll stop there. Um, first, if we could have questions, a couple questions for Andrea. If, are you? OK. Well, let's, let's start with that. He's and then been we'll waiting. Okay. I know. I'm just a little and, early. Can you, can <coughs> you identify? Stites. I'm a, uh, a Berkman fellow at Harvard, and I spent, my, I'm, I'm 68 years old, I should add, because I have a, a little longer view. 
Much of my career was devoted to directing very large reporting projects for places like the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times and the Center for Public Integrity. And I say that to give myself a little bit of a uh, sort of my cultural sighting, but it, it, it also is context for the fact that I don't experience very much investigative reporting as game changing. I have seen an awful lot of it, I've overseen a lot of it, that seems to change a game, but the change then the game just slides back to where it was and often veers off in worse directions than it was before the reporting was done, not as a cause and effect, it just has a momentary uh, thing. I do think that some things are inflection points. Abu Ghraib, I think, it, it was fully an inflection point. Watergate is an inflection point. But the great stream of stuff goes on. Uh, and so what I'm wondering is whether you see, any of you see, um, any thing in the, in the way that reporting is changing, that all these wonderful new tools, that actually could lead to journalism that makes the changes the game so that it stays changed as opposed to simply have a little blip of interest and then goes away. Well, I can say something to that, which is um, what you're saying is absolutely true. And I was just thinking as I was talking about the Dana Priest and Ann Hull thing, like, gosh, did that really totally change? I should like go look and see, you know, if Walter Reed, like what's the situation there? Because that, you know, I don't know that that was a long term game changer, even as I was saying it. One of the things that I think that some of the new technologies help with is it's a lot easier to find out what's gone before. There was a Pulitzer uh, Prize finalist this year for feature writing, uh, I think it was feature writing, I don't think it was investigative reporting, um, that was the St. Petersburg Times. It was a project called For Their Own Good. And it was about just horrific abuse uh, at a boys detention center in Florida. And what most impressed me about the project was they went back and they looked in the newspaper, their own newspaper archives. And they found that, you know what, this story had popped up every 15 years or so. I'm making up that number, but every you know, certain cycle for a century. So then the story became 100 years. And I don't know. I mean, I know that Ben is still, Ben Montgomery and Waveney and Moore are still following up on that story. Uh, and I mean, really awful abuse, stuff that, you know, you just wouldn't believe. And uh, I know they're still following up on that story. Um, so it's good that the Times isn't letting go of it. But I have to think that having access, that, that some of the tools we have to access prior research information and check people, uh, make people accountable for things that were said or done in prior, prior things, allow us to present those stories like that in a slightly different way. So that it isn't just the sexy, if it bleeds, it leads thing, you know, abuse at boys' home. But here, look, dear readers, a hundred years. And I, I, we can't, you know, our role as advocates or not, again, is an important question. I have talked to many journalists now who simply say they are advocates. I think that's still something we have to resolve. Um, but I think making the public accountable to its own history is a way, you know, in, in a way that they can actually ex hear uh, may help with that. But it's certainly a long-term issue. Jim? Uh, Jim Parity, Comparative Media Studies. Um, I'm wondering about stories because I worry about stories. Uh, I think of, uh, you know, Glenn Beck and George Soros and, you know, the various tales, the way in which people uh, create stories and uh, the necessity in a story to reduce elements in order to get the story to work. And, uh, you know, the, the corrections, the need for corrections and, and how do we counter the, the problems that stories raise because, uh, so much news gets storified and, you know, the whole problem of tabloid news uh, and creating the great story and the, uh, the effect of the great story and so forth, uh, how do we control this? Well, I think it's a pressure that you find in any kind of reporting. It just shifts depending on what kind of reporting it is. If you're a um, inverted pyramid reporter and you're rushing to get that story in, you've got a different kind of pressure, but it's just the same pressure that might require corrections. I mean, so that, I think, is a different issue than the narrative. There's the pressure to have a great story to, to, you know, maybe you haven't checked everything yet, maybe you haven't and you want to go with it, and, and, you know, and, and so it's the ethics of any kind of reporting, I think, have to be brought to bear the same way on storytellers, but certainly uh, there are some destructive uh, aspects of storytelling. It can be reductive, it can generalize, um, 
I think unfortunately or fortunately, um, it's how people understand things. So to say I'm not going to do that because it might, because people I don't like do, do it, or because it might cause problems, I think um, may not be that useful of an approach. And it is a difficult question because uh, did you ever do, did you, did you do reporting yourself? I assume that at some point you were doing reporting. Time time. And you probably talked to academics at some point. Mm -hmm. And you probably said, I can't put that in the paper. Can you tell it to me in a way that my readers will get it? So I think any kind of journalism is an effort to take very, very, very specific community by uh, information from experts and bring it to a different community in a way that they can understand it. It is always a process of reduction and generalization. The problem is when you over-reduce, over-simplify, or over-generalize, which again I think is more an attitude of doing quality uh, work that's important. I think simply using story techniques, again, some of these studies have shown that reporters who aren't doing narrative reporting in their minds are already doing this. So it's better that we be aware of how people, and, and you know what? If you have a partial narrative in there, people will make up the rest of it. This is one of the things that they found. They will complete the narrative themselves, sometimes in profoundly incorrect ways. Now, I'm serious. And so I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is if people are already doing this, what is the most ethical, responsible, complete way we can do it that, that is not so specific and uh, jargony that they can't understand it? Just a, a further comment. I mean, uh, in some ways, this is where the historian meets the journalist right. because the historian has the same problem, and that is even the most massive history uh, is uh, you can't in some put way, everything in there. It's, it's bent. So, I mean, we're constantly fighting this problem of uh, creating the uh, the illusion, or I mean, there's always a, an element of illusion in the story. So, and and that's a legitimate thing in storytelling, but. Uh, you know, when we're trying to report uh, facts and events and things with as much accuracy as possible, uh, it seems that, you know, in some ways we're, we're caught in this. this uh, well, if we this want the speed of the 24-hour news cycle and the accuracy mm -hmm. of peer-reviewed journals, mm -hmm. you know, there, it's gonna, that's going to clash sometimes. It's, mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be casualties of that. I think we, we try to honor both things as much as we can. Um, but also to realize that, I mean, I don't think story is inherently evil. Um, and that the more... <laughs> it's not inherently good either. No, that, that, it isn't. A <laughs> it's a tool. And so, but I think that if we know that it, it is uh, often what ends up being a game changer, um, th and if these are our important stories, then, then I think to never use story to address them is probably a mistake. But also, I'm not saying everything, every time should be a story. But when you have these individual inverted pyramid pieces that are coming out or blips, you know, that are 300 word briefs on the web that people are trying to digest. If we don't provide that longer stretch for them to put them in context, then just giving them those pieces is not doing them a service. I think the, the giant pool of money was a really good example of that. You read all this stuff and if you're not a finance person, you, you catch little bits of it, but it may not be sticking. But you hear that and you're like, oh, that's what this guy does. And that's why this happened. I think it, that's an important story. So I'm going to sneak in ahead of you. I'm going to impose a little moderator's privilege now. Um, that was, Andrew, that was wonderful. And this panel has, uh, I, I think, hit from three sides this question in a, in a uh, way I found enormously valuable. Um, there were two things. One is a comment which on this, on this question of story and facts. I, I, this is an old, old argument. And I'm always reminded of, um, I'm a science journalist to begin with. Uh, and I'm reminded of uh, Henri Poincaré's comment way back in 1900 or so. He said, you know, in this new century, as we accumulate all the scientific uh, knowledge, uh, our biggest responsibility is to decide which facts are, worth, are, are worthy of being discovered. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the storyteller's task all the time. But the question I have, that, 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 that's editorializing, the question I have, and it's really addressed to all of you, so we've talked about uh, story, we've talked about story making, we've talked about ways to think about and the, the, the sort of framework in which we can understand why crises uh, are, are not crises anymore but crises embedded in this sort of uh, much larger matrix of events that have to be uh, understood. Um, and that's been great and I'm going to take it home and, and think about it for, for a long time. But one thing we haven't talked about is the a connection of this thinking to its audience. And I'm thinking specifically, if, if any of you have any thoughts, uh, 
on distribution channels or distribution forms that will accommodate storytelling that extends over a long time, like what ProPublica has done on some of its stories, or that extends over a range of media or accumulation of stuff from, from audience, the sort that you were talking about, Andrea. How do we, how do we construct uh, a media, or how do we evoke a media distribution channel that will do better than the, the, the patchwork we've got now? I think you, his organization has a fabulous example. I mean, and it's still evolving. I mean, these are not things that have set answers, but Frontline has been doing some fabulous partnerships, and they've got the Law and Order website um, that uh, basically there were these murders, there were these deaths in New Orleans post-Katrina, and um, I believe it was a joint ProPublica and Times-Picayune project that Frontline got involved in. They started investigating, and they said, you know what, there's a story here. We don't know what it is yet, but we're going to start rolling it out now. And they set up a website, and they actually put out calls for information from the community, and they let people see what they were up to. Now, I'm sure some things, you know, they kept close to their chest so that they wouldn't blow things that they were trying to get out of police agencies. Um, but I think that that, uh, which ends up, you know, they didn't know quite where they were going in the beginning with it, the frontline people were telling me, but they wanted to get stuff up on the website, they wanted to get things out, and that's already made a tremendous difference. And I don't think they're even done with it yet, but I don't know if you want to, if you have anything to say about that. Do you know about that project at all? I mean, I only know a little bit about that project, which is something we're very proud of. Uh, I think that the, the incremental stories that you're talking about were stories that we saw fit to be daily news stories, but weren't, that, you know, they were the dots, and uh, and there was always this larger intention of, of connecting them at some point, both through the, the television program and, and, and through the reporting that my colleague A.C. Thompson would do. Um, I, and that's, that's kind of how that has, has come to be. Um, and, and just aside from that, while I have the microphone, I was just going to say that uh, I think that there's also uh, a longevity issue, uh, a, a benefit uh, that's coming from, uh, from that project, uh, from the presence on the web of news uh, that, that will preserve the impact, I think, of, a, of uh, these investigative projects so that they don't just slip away uh, into, into history and, and be forgotten and let the things that they're supposed to impact uh, uh, revert to, to how they were before a story was published. So um, I think that's one of the, the shifts that we're seeing as well. I want to try to tie the three things together, the three angles. So what if the problem is actually that we're trying to interpret things before we have enough data? And that's what stories become, too much data, too little time to interpret the patterns. So what if we think about this as meaning making and there's constantly a map of information and we're trying to navigate that as people who are in the moment, in the experience, or slightly at a distance? which would suggest we need harvesters of situations, curation, pattern detection, interpretation and prediction so we could see how good people are at interpreting. In other words, scary thing, how accurate is a reporter at finding the right patterns? And we could also be tracking the predictions and we could have pros who are paid doing that along with people on the ground who aren't paid but have more local knowledge. That would get rid of the real time. I mean, now you have the melding of history and story. You have local knowledge along with regional and national experts. You kind of create a sphere of information. But how, I mean, how does this differ from, from journalism? Um, so I worked for CBS and my cousin worked for NBC. It's become a lot of Mad Libs journalism. People are filling in the blanks because they get the press release, they hear what other experts are saying, and they start to look for those quotes, they sense what yeah, they this need. Boskowski has written about this phenomenon exactly. So, yeah. you know, that's what you do when the pattern's rushing, the stuff is rushing at you too fast. If you play rock band and try to play drums, same thing. <laughs> so the question is, is patterns the way for us to all navigate massive amounts of data? In fact, that maps to the mind, that's neural networks. I'm wondering if we're in a real-time neural network. There are other thing. patterns. I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. The, you know, the stuff, the things, the information is overwhelming. So, but I'm just, I'm just trying to say the patterns you want to follow um, are those of people and power. And, and uh, you know, if, you, if you're missing that, then you're, you're reifying the stuff and you're, you're missing the, so the story. Quick, but I don't see how it differs from what journalists always Well, a quick follow-up to wherever Chris is. 
the, I've been in a number of these things, and one of the questions is, where is power? Is it at the top of the mm. pyramid or at the base? Mm. And so traditional journalism has been about top-down interpretation for the masses, for the base, and I'm wondering, if we actually look at it the other way, do we find an intersection and the patterns match? Well, I mean, I, I've been thinking about this very interesting question of, I, I would say, does journalism ever change the game? I mean, let, let's just take it as a hypothetical. Um, because you can, you, I can think of many things where journalists report on what's, you know, what's happening, but in terms of actually instigating change, I mean, if, if I think of things that, are to me historical events in my lifetime, okay? I think of the civil rights movement. That's first and foremost. Uh, and that was not, in, you know, that was not from journalism. Right. Um, that, 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 was, that was really grassroots. Uh, I mean, the war, you know, the Pentagon Papers, that was fine, but, you know, it didn't stop the war. The Vietnamese stopped the war. But they gave so, insights so just, into the system of how power was used. But that wasn't used. the question. That, I mean, if you Understood. use the word game changer, it sounds like there's a causal, you know. I, anyway, I just... If you get people into the system with knowledge, they can start to try to exert agency. That, a lot yeah, of people yeah. don't know where to push. Yeah. I, it's just yeah. A, a comment. I was trying to tie together kind of the sense of the barriers and see if there's one there there that can then fall out into tr traditional journalism as well as real-time data visualization, as well as to the little thing that becomes the big thing, BP, mm -hmm. and then becomes the small thing again. Well, I would like to just toss in on, on Game Changer. So thank you. Because I'm not necessarily advocating for journalists as advocates, by Game Changer I mean that change the public's complete understanding and awareness of a story, that change the, that, that are these moments, I mean it's certainly not the long durée that change history as we think of long-term history, but make it possible for the public to understand and engage with, us, with events that affect them in a way that they were not aware of or engaging with it before. And so that I think that, that journalism and a lot of different kinds of public communication can do. And I would like to just toss in one comment that I've heard a couple times from a Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, long-form writer, Jackie Bonashinsky, who's done a lot of fabulous, fabulous work, narrative and otherwise. Um, and she talks about when she first started out as a reporter, you know, they had the morning edition, they had the evening edition, they had after, I mean, they were putting stuff out all the time. She was redoing, updating, revising her stories all the time. And so part of this, everything rushing at us, I think is a real feeling, but I think part of it is also that there was this lull between in journalism history where it was pretty well funded and people could focus in a way that maybe they didn't 10, 20 years before. I mean, I, I think that the uh, well-fed, well-nourished journalist who could really spend a long time on a story, um, you know, was advertising money at a specific sort of point in time. I don't think that was the eternal ideal that happened for any long period before technology hit us. I think that this is just a new iteration of something that we've experienced in some ways before. All right, we've got two minutes of seven. So I'm just curious if any member of the panel has a question they would like to put to any other member of the panel before calling it a night. Is there anything that was said to you that struck, struck you in any way or just raised your curiosity? I've stunned you into silence. Well, I mean, I have a lot of questions for the audience. Ah, good. Would not, you know, but um, including, like, I, actually this dialogue we just had in terms of, well, what is what is journalism? I mean, are we, are we seeing anything different than what, I mean, is there anything new in, in, in this whole concept of slow-moving crises? I mean, we, to come back to that, because that really is our topic. So, I, I mean, a little time afterwards. But I would love to know if you've reached any conclusions or, you know, if there's anything um, enlightening about this session that you're taking away with you. Microphone, please. You can't escape and tell us who you are. And this will be the last comment. Oh, I'm sorry. No, don't sorry. apologize. Just be wonderful. Somebody's got it. I'm Janet Aldrich, and um, the Coalition to Preserve the Public Record. I've been working on this little project for the past uh, seven years, and I think the journalism is really um, like wide open right now. I think it's changing immensely, and. Um, I, I am a senior, and I think there are many people who are 
are really floating out there, potential journalists that have lived a lot of a lot of life right now, that have a lot to offer in in uh, perspective and in watching a slow mo moving crisis. And uh, what fo forced me into this scene uh, a long time ago, I reported on a few towns. And so I had that in my blood. Once you start the reporting scene, it's, it gets in you. You don't realize it, but you're, I'm always reporting something. So, um, but what I do is video journaling. And I have a website, so I comment on it. And I'm really not expertise, and I really should go back and take about 10 courses in language and whatever. But I really want to say that it's like it's, I have, you know, really challenged myself in 10 years to learn videography, to, to start a, a website, to a blog. I've put up 600 films on Blip. I have had 13,000 views in the last uh, less than 12 months, and 20% are embedding them in their website. I am, I am a news outlet, I, and Hill, the Hill is following me. And in 98, my son handed me a computer and said, uh, I said, aren't you going to help me with it? No. He says, I think you can do it. So I think that if we challenge ourselves and stretch, okay, and allow these, not, I mean, not just block people like me, but what I've been doing is capturing public hearings, press conferences, and events. And what I have been doing is to my own investigative uh, report on how the media reports. And so I started out. Um, by just saying I was, do I was doing the documentary. And so like they would let me just sidle right, saddle right up beside them. And so like I would just tape whatever they were taping and then I would tape them. And I have tons of footage of streams of cameras and little people and big people and being, you know, all sorts of media disruption that, um, that has uh, formed story. So I love what I'm doing. Um, and I'm about to set it off like pro, uh, what did you call it, pro? ProPublica. ProPublica. I'm setting this up as the Coalition to Preserve the Public Record Archive Project. I want it to go national. And I want people, journalists, to put their footage into this project as public record documents. So I think, yeah, there's going to be, there's a lot of money that needs to be found to do this sort of thing. But you know what? 13,000 views with no advertisement says that the public wants the story and they have they want to see what a journalist says about the story but they want the story they want to read it they want to have that story and own it so that's my comment thank you thank you and can we now thank our panelists